Hi there, this is Callan Bentley. Uh, we're going to take a look right now at where the carbon on Earth comes from. Since we're going to be spending some time in this unit learning about how the carbon cycle works and what happens when it gets unbalanced, we probably owe it to ourselves to take a moment to reflect on where carbon comes from in the first place. So in short, it comes from stars. Stars a lot like our sun. This is an image of our sun. And when we look at our sun, we need to realize, A, it's a star that happens to be really, really close to us, so it looks different from other stars. And that what's going on with the sun, the reason it gives off so much energy, is it's a giant thermonuclear reactor. Uh, if you haven't heard the sun described that way before, don't worry, we'll explain what that means. Basically, it means that the sun is capable of facilitating fusion reactions. Fusion reactions take small atoms like hydrogen, and they smush them together into the same space, so that you make things like deuterium, hydrogen 2, shown there on the left. That fusion reaction gives off energy, and it gives off uh, little particles. And then you can take that newer, bigger atom and fuse it with another hydrogen, and you can make something like helium-3. If you do that again and you make another helium-3, you can fuse it with the first helium-3, and then you end up producing helium-4. Now, helium-4 is not carbon, uh, so you might wonder why I'm talking about how we make helium instead of how we make carbon, but it turns out that you need helium-4 in order to make carbon. Here's how that works. Two helium-4 atoms are fused together to make a beryllium-8 atom. This one has four subatomic particles in the nucleus. This one has four in its nucleus as well. When they get fused together, you end up with eight in the nucleus, so that's beryllium-8. If you take another helium-4 and fuse it with the beryllium-8, that gives you carbon-12, which is what we're interested in. So, it takes four hydrogens to make one helium. It takes three heliums to make one carbon. So overall, to make one carbon, how many hydrogens do you need? Hopefully you do the math here. Four times three equals 12. Good, so it takes 12 hydrogens fused together in a certain sequence in order to make a single carbon atom. And the only place that this is capable of happening is in stars. To sum things up here, we basically have a bunch of fusion reactions that have to take place in order to get a carbon atom. And it's not a direct path. Uh, many different steps have to happen. So we know that stars can form carbon, but we are not on a star. We are on Earth, a planet. So how did carbon get to Earth? In short, uh, Earth is formed from a nebula. Um, this is what a nebula looks like. A nebula is a big dispersed cloud of gas and dust out in space. And uh, that nebula had some carbon in it. So when it condensed to form our solar system, um, some of the planets got carbon as a result, as well as every other element that's out there. You might wonder where the nebula itself came from, though. And that's a good question. If it had carbon and it gave it to the planets, where did the nebula get its carbon? Well, the nebula actually came from the explosion of an old star. This explosion is called a supernova, and it's basically when a star's expansive powers, the powers that push outward, exceed the gravity that keeps the star in one spot. So it blows up in a spectacular explosion that disperses particles all throughout space. Later on, that big dispersed cloud of particles contracts again, and that's what makes a solar system. So what forces are going to act on that big dispersed cloud of particles, that nebula, to make it contract into a solar system, into a star, into planets, into asteroids and comets and things like that? Well, first off, the same force that clumps dust together underneath your sofa or underneath your bed, that is going to be a really important force out in space too. So static charges basically take very, very small particles and make them clump together. And that's probably the original force that started making the nebula more clumpy. As time went by, some of those really big dust bunnies got big enough that they were able to exert gravitational tugs on their neighbors. But gravity is a very weak force, and you need a big mass in order for it to amount to much of anything. So basically, once you get big dust bunnies out in space, gravity can go to work on them and make them clumpier and clumpier. And you take that big spinning cloud of nebula material and you concentrate its mass into a lesser and lesser number of particles of greater and greater mass. Eventually, some of those particles are big enough that they congeal into planets and they'll sort themselves out gravitationally to be relatively sphere-like with the heavy stuff in the middle and the light stuff on top. 
Overall, if we look at the nebula basically from the star in the middle all the way out towards the edge, we notice a big pattern, and that is that the heavy elements tend to be clumped towards the center of the solar system, and the outer part of the solar system is enriched in the lighter elements. So the inner planets are like Mercury and Venus and Earth and Mars. They tend to be rich in heavy elements like silicon and carbon, nitrogen, magnesium, and oxygen. Whereas the outer planets tend to be um, uh, relatively lightweight elements like hydrogen, helium, and things like that. Here is an example of uh, one of the clumps left over from the formation of our solar system. This is an asteroid in the asteroid belt. It's called Itakawa 25143, and it's basically a big three-dimensional pile of rocks out in space, gravity holding them all together. If you were to go and, and land on Itakawa and kick one of these boulders, it would go flying off into space, never to return. A somewhat bigger example of the results of forming a solar system is the planet that you live on. All right, so this planet originally formed from junk out in space, dust and, and gas and silicon and oxygen and carbon, and that's why the planet Earth has carbon on it today. Thanks a lot for your attention. I hope you enjoy the rest of the lesson.